Genesis chapter 34 is where we're at tonight. And you might remember last week we saw Jacob stop short of where God had called him to go. God had called him, uh, Genesis 31, 30, uh, 31, 3. God said, return to the land of your fathers and to your family. And God gave Jacob at that time this wonderful promise. I'll be with you. It's one of the greatest promises that we have as believers, that God is with us, never going to leave us, never going to forsake us. I'm so thankful for that. But Jacob, he stops in Shechem. He doesn't go all the way. He's, he's roughly 50, 80 miles from his ultimate destination where he's supposed to be. And his decision to stop short, we saw last week, may have been motivated by the fact that Shechem was a good place to raise livestock. It was a good business decision. It was a good decision to make a buck. You know, ultimately, it was a terrible decision for his family. And we're going to see that today. He did return to the promised land. He did leave Padan Aram. And uh, he might have thought, well, you know, at least I'm in the promised land. You know, that's got to be good enough, right? I mean, come on. And, uh, but the reality is, is it's still not where God had called him to be or called him to go. Partial obedience is total disobedience. Partial obedience is complete rebellion. That's just the reality of it. God knew where Jacob was in his walk with the Lord, and God knew that the people in the land of Canaan, Canaan would be um, a bad influence. They were so very wicked, and then they would be a bad influence on Jacob and his family. And God knew that Jacob needed his family around them if they were to continue to grow in their walks and their knowledge of the Lord. They needed that type of spiritual stability that the family offered them in their lives. But instead of being obedient, Jacob, he stopped short. Uh, Jacob is not planning on just taking a break here in Shechem either because we saw last week uh, that he bought a house, man. I mean, he built himself a house. He's planning to settle in and he's going to be there for the long haul. And again, it's disobedience to God. It's disobedience to God's word. It's disobedience to God's plan for Jacob's life. And Jacob is going to pay a price for his disobedience. And Jacob's family is also going to pay a price for his disobedience. And this is another reminder to each one of us that you know what? Sin has an effect on those around us, those people that we love, right? Disobedience equals Missed blessing. I mean, in my mind, that's an equation. Disobedience equals missed blessing. Disobedience opens the door to otherwise needless sufferings. There's no safer place for any one of us than to be where God has called us to be. I mean, we might think that, you know, uh, God's called us here, but, you know, that looks a lot nicer over there. I mean, we might look around and, and understand, you know, uh, it, God's called us here, but, you know, there are more opportunities over there, you know? Um, guess what? Apart from God's will in your life, there's no place that poses a greater danger to you than when you're outside of his will, when you're someplace he doesn't uh, want you to be, and it poses a tremendous danger to you, to your family, and to all the people around you that you love. And those places, when we're someplace that God doesn't want us to be, when we're outside of God's will, what happens is it retards our spiritual growth. You know, it's wasted years like we've seen in, in Jacob's life. When in its wasted years, it retards our growth. It retards our walk with the Lord. Complete and total obedience to God is the only safe place for us. And because of Jacob's disobedience, all kinds of problems begin to unfold in Jacob's life as we are going to see in this chapter. Verse 1 says, Now Dinah, the daughter of Leah, whom she had born to Jacob, went out to see the daughters of the land. Now Dinah is probably 14, 16 years old here. She's completely innocent. She's just going to go out. She wants to hang out with other girls in the area. You know, maybe she's looking for a friend. We don't know for sure. Maybe she's, you know, curious about the culture. 
that uh, they're living in now, but she's completely ignorant of any danger. I mean, you know, she, she, she doesn't know. She's just a young girl. Sometimes we see today girls dress in very provocative ways, you know, and, and they just want to fit into the culture. They just want to fit in amongst their friends. But the way they dress is asking for trouble. I mean, we've all seen it. We've all uh, seen girls like, what are you doing? You know, it was a failure on Jacob's part right here not to provide supervision in a completely pagan city. As parents, we need to be wise for our kids. You know, they may not like it, but guess what? It's okay. Doesn't matter if they like it or not, because that's what parenting is all about. Parenting is exercising proper oversight and supervision and providing guidance to our kids in the ways of the Lord. And verse 2 says, And when Shechem, Shechem, the son of Hamor the Hivite, prince of the country, saw her, he took her and lay with her, and he violated her. Hamor is the king over the people in this area of Shechem. Shechem is his son. Uh, and we read that he's a prince. And the Hebrew, the Hebrew word translated here, uh, stating that Shechem violated Dinah, it means that he afflicted her. He oppressed her. But what he did was he raped her. And again, it's not her fault. And in this Canaanite culture, that's just what people did, you know, especially if you had any kind of power. You know, Can the Canaanites had become so vile, so sinful. It's just what they did. You know, they took what they wanted and, and you know, we'll just fix it later. Now, Shechem didn't rape Dinah and then just discard her as, as if that makes it any better. But it says, verse 3, his soul was strongly attracted to Dinah, the daughter of Jacob, and he loved the young woman and spoke kindly to the young woman. So when it says here that he spoke kindly to the young woman, it means that he spoke to her from his heart. He feels love for her as much as he knows what love is. And verse 4, so Shechem spoke to his father Hamor, saying, get me this young woman as a wife. You know, he wants his father to make the necessary arrangements uh, for them to be together in that culture. You know, they were arranged marriages by the parents. So he tells his dad, hey, make it happen, pops, you know. So Shechem, he doesn't love Dinah, though, in a true sense, right? It's a selfish love that he has. He loves her for what he can get from her, not what he could be to her or what he could give to her. Uh, first off, true love waits. It's very clear. For the New Testament, 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 through 7. Um, if you want to turn there, you can turn there real quick. If not, just listen. 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 through 7. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one should take advantage of and defraud his brother in this matter because the Lord is the avenger of all such. Also, we all, as we also forewarned you and testified, for God did not call us to uncleanness but to holiness. So selfish, sinful love, better known as lust, you know, it attempts, it attempts to take advantage of other people right? It's wrapped up in what looks like love, but it's there only to defraud the other person, right? It's to trick them into getting what they want. And so true love, though, it seeks to lift up. It seeks only that which is best for the other person. Its desire is to see that other person blossom and achieve their fullest potential, right? That's the love uh, that God has called us to as men for our wives, right? To see them become the, the person God intends them to be and expect nothing in return. That's what agape love is all about. It doesn't seek its own. In verse 
5, it says, And Jacob heard that he had defiled Dinah, his daughter. So in that culture, Dinah being um, raped or defiled would ruin her chances of ever being married, ever having, you know, a family. And when Jacob hears about what happened to Dinah, it says his sons were in the, uh, with the livestock in the field. So Jacob held his peace until they came. Then Hamor, the father of Shechem, went out to Jacob to speak to him. Hamor, uh, he goes out to speak to Jacob and, uh, so that they could come to some type of arrangement in regards to Dinah and Shechem so that they could be married. And verse 7, it says, And the sons of Jacob, now these are the 11 brothers of Dinah now, they came in from the field when they heard it. The news of what happened to Dinah gets out to the boys as they were tending the flocks. And remember, that's why Jacob is uh, in this area. It was better for raising sheep, raising his flocks. It was better than raising sheep and goats here in Shechem than it was in Hebron where he was supposed to be with his father and his family, where God had told him to go, right? It's better for raising sheep, not so good for raising kids. And it says, and the men were grieved and very angry. And the word there for grieved means that they were pained. They were pained with anger. It was like somebody took a knife and stabbed them in the heart. It was a painful uh, anger that they had. And the oldest sons now, just to kind of give us perspective, the oldest sons of Jacob now are mid-20s, maybe slightly older than mid-20s. Joseph, he's still probably pretty young. And it says that they were so angry at her because Shechem had done a disgraceful thing in Israel by lying with Jacob's daughter, a thing which ought not to be done. So they view this as a sin against their sister. They view this as a violation, right? In this Middle Eastern culture, it was also viewed as a violation against the family. And it was considered an act of violence, not only against the sister, but against the family as her guardians. And in that culture, they viewed the weaker members of the household as those who were to be protected by the men of the family. So this violation would have been taken very, very personally in that culture. In verse 8, but Hamor spoke with them, saying, the soul of my son Shechem longs for your daughter. Please give her to him as a wife. And it seems like at this point, Hamor, he doesn't know what's gone on. He's, you know, just trying to be a good dad, maybe. And he goes on to say, verse 9, and make marriages with us, give your daughters to us, and take our daughters to yourself. So you shall dwell with us, and the land shall be before you. Dwell and trade in it, and acquire possessions for yourself in it. So Hamor, he proposes marriage, uh, you know, uh, between Dinah and Shechem, Hamor's son, and maybe Hamor sees that um, many of Jacob's boys, they're of marrying age. And if they're not, you know, they're going to be, right? So he throws out a little temptation. Hey, look, we got girls, you know, they want to get married. Give us Dinah and we'll give our girls to your boys because your boys are probably looking down the road. They're going to want to get married. And he proposes that they intermarry with the Canaanites. You know, we'll just be one big happy family. You know, stay here with us, do business, get rich. It'll be great. And so that's the proposal that Hamor offers to, you know, the boys, to Jacob. It's a similar thing that we see today as Christian parents, you know. Our sons and daughters, they meet girls or boys that aren't believers. And then it's, you know, I know she or he's not a believer, you know. But look at what a great person they are. Maybe if I go out with them, I can win them for Christ. You know what? It doesn't work that way, you know? Um, some of us have experienced it firsthand. Some of us don't know it yet. But it's easier for a Christian to be pulled down by an unbeliever 
than it is for an unbeliever to uh, than it is for a Christian to raise up an unbeliever in in a relationship like that. It's just the way it is. That's just the facts of the matter. Yeah, but this situation, you know what? We're different. You know, God tells us not to be unequally yoked with unbelievers for a reason. It's for our protection. The protection of his plan for our life is also included in that protection. And I, and I tell people when they tell me that, guess what? You know, I'm sorry to say you're not an exception. It's just the way it is. Someone who is unequally yoked is disregarding the instruction of, of the Lord. Make no mistake about it. There's, there's a price to pay for that type of obedient, disobedience. In verse 11, it says, Then Shechem said to her father and her brothers, Let me find favor in your eyes, and whatever you say to me, I will give. Ask me ever so much dowry and gift, and I will give according to what you say to me. But give me the young woman as a wife. And again, this is just the culture uh, the way it was. In Shechem's eyes, you know what? He's doing something good. He's doing something honorable. He's doing something noble. He's doing something that's right. The Canaanite culture, you know, sunk to such depravity. Shechem thinks that everyone should be excited about, you know, his proposal. And neither Shechem or his father, Hamor, feel the need to apologize for what's gone on. In their eyes, there was nothing to be ashamed of. You know, an unattended woman, she's fair game. And uh, even this type of sexual activity, this forcible sexual activity, uh, I mean, it's even part of their religious practices during this time. It's really terrible. And it just makes me think as, as we were, um, as I was looking through this, doesn't it just make you so happy that God has given us his word to keep us on track in regards to right and wrong, you know? I mean, I just, I just, I'm so thankful. Sadly, it's not held in the esteem that it used to be held in our country, but through us as the church, through us as believers, you know, as a people of God, we're to have this preserving influence uh, on those that are around us, those, are, you know, around us uh, locally, but also in our nation, because guess what? We know what's right. We're to be the standard bearers of right and wrong. So verse 13 says, But the son of Jacob answered Shechem and Hamor his father and spoke deceitfully because he had defiled Dinah their sister. And we're going to see some terrible things now about to happen. The sons of Jacob, they begin to speak up and they begin to deal with the situation and it wasn't their place. They take over the negotiation here. And it would seem that they take the lead here while Jacob is happy to take a back seat. And he should have been taking the lead as a father, but he fails in this respect. Um, Jacob hates confrontation. He hates it. He wants to avoid it. Even when the situation demands that he act. And he fails to take charge of the situation. He fails to take step up. He fails to be the leader of his family in this time of crisis. And it's a total failure for Jacob. And when dads fail to step up and take the leadership role in a situation like this or in the family, the kids are forced to take over. And you know what? The kids... They'll do that. They'll, they'll step up and they'll try to take over. Jacob does nothing in the situation, so his boys step up. But they step up with an untempered, ungodly anger because they're young kids and they're not up to the challenge, right? Because Jacob will not take charge because he won't take the role of leader as a, as a father. Things are going to get a lot worse. Jacob should have stepped up so that what's coming about could have been avoided. And it's amazing that the boys are going to accept the invitation to intermarry with the Canaanites if they get circumcised, right? And what's amazing about that is when the proposal is made along with that counter offer, yeah, we'll marry, you know, intermarry, you just get circumcised, it's a done deal. 
What's amazing about that is Jacob, he doesn't say a word, right? He's the patriarch. He's one of the patriarchs of the single most important bloodline in human history. It's the bloodline that God has chosen to bring the Messiah into the world, right? And this king of this little kingdom in Canaan makes this offer that would absorb the people of Israel like all the other tribes of people that they have absorbed uh, by them. And uh, Jacob doesn't say a thing. Jacob should have jumped up and shouted at the top of his lungs. There's no way that's going to happen, not as long as I'm alive. But he doesn't do it. He fails to lead his family in what's right. So the boys jump in, and they're going to deceive the people of Shechem. And what these boys are going to do, I mean, it is so wrong, right? They're not going to bring justice to the situation. They're going to go beyond what is just, and they're going to slaughter innocent life. They're going to allow their fleshly anger to draw them into sin. And that's why, you know what, we have instruction to avoid these kinds of things. We have instruction in Romans 12, 19. It says, Beloved, do not avenge yourself, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, Vengeance, uh, sorry, do, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. And the reason why we shouldn't engage in vengeance is because, man, our hearts are so dark, our hearts are so wicked, we'll take things too far. It's better to let God deal with it. So we continue to read, the sons of Jacob answered Shechem and Hamor, his father, and spoke deceitfully. And it would appear that when Shechem says, Whatever you say, I'll give. Ask me ever so much dowry and gift, and I'll give according to what you say to me. But give me the young woman. It would appear at that point, these boys, they huddle up, and they start brainstorming. What are we going to do? And they come up with this scheme of circumcision. You know what? People that are liars and deceivers, they're bad enough. But those that engage in deception using religion as a guise, Man, they're the worst. The entire thing that they're going to propose, it's a complete lie, right? And where did the boys pick up this deceitful, uh, deceitful behavior? Well, you know what? They, they did see their dad tell Uncle Esau that they, that they would travel south and meet uh, Esau and Seir. But you know what Jacob did? He went north. He, he, it was a flat-out lie. And it seems like Jacob, maybe, maybe, you know, he excused it before the boys when they asked him, hey, Dad, how come we're going north? Isn't Seir south? I mean, what's, what's up with that? Maybe, you know, uh, whatever the case may be, Jacob's son, they're watching his example. They're watching the example of their father. And we've said it so many times already in this study, is that the sins of the father are often reproduced in the children. As believers, we're not to lie. We're not to be deceitful in any way. You know what? I always cringe when I hear a Christian say, I hope it wasn't wrong that I lied, you know? But I had to, right? Lying is a sin in any form, and what it does is it reveals your lack of trust in the Lord. So often people say, well, if I didn't lie, then this or that would happen. You know, it was my only choice. Not true. It's not true. You can be truthful and give room for God to work. You know, I have a friend that he was smuggling Bibles into to Cuba. And one time crossing into the country, they specifically asked him if he had uh, any Bibles. And had they found any Bibles on him, they would have confiscated the Bibles. They would have detained him. The trip would have been a total failure. You know, all that money would be wasted and, you know, the Bibles are gone. You know, so what do you think he said? He was faced with a, an opportunity to lie. Or he was faced with the opportunity to, truth, to tell the truth. And, and you know what he did? What do you think he did? What would you have done? You know what he did? He said, I got a suitcase full of Bibles. They're like, okay, come on. They just waved them through. 
You know what? He told the truth and he allowed God to intervene. You know, God cannot and God will not bless a lie. God honors and blesses faith and trust in him. Lying is just an omission on your part or my part that, hey, we don't trust the Lord to move in our situation and we need to take matters in our own hands, right? It's an omission in that moment that we're more like Jacob than we are like Israel. Trust the Lord and allow him to work. That's, that's what, what's the song say? Trust and obey. It's the only way right? Um, anyway, their excuse for being deceitful is because he had def- they had defiled, Shechem had defiled Dinah, their sister. Verse 14, and they said to them, we can't do this thing to give our sister to one who's uncircumcised. I mean, that would be a reproach to us. But um, I don't know. Maybe on this condition we would consent to you. If you'll become as we are, if every male of you is circumcised. And you know what? It just gets worse and it gets worse. I mean, these guys are not only lying, they're using spiritual jargon, spiritual words, and they're using the sign of God's covenant to them to cover up their intent to murder every male in the city because of what one man had did to Dinah. And they continue... You know, then we'll give our daughters to you. You guys get circumcised. We'll give our daughters to you and we'll take your daughters to us and we'll dwell with you and we'll become one people. Not a peep from Jacob. He's failing so monumentally here and not stepping up to lead his family at this moment. You know, it's just sin on Jacob's part that he doesn't say anything, that he doesn't step in and put a stop to this lie. And verse 17 says, but if you will heed us and be circumcised, then we'll take our daughter and be gone, right? If you will not heed us and be circumcised, then we'll take our daughter and be gone. Listen, hey, it's my ball, my rules. You don't like it? We'll leave. We'll go home. And their words pleased Hamor and Shechem, Hamor's son. So the young man did not delay to do the thing. I mean, he's in a He's in a hurry because he delighted in Jacob's daughter. He was more honorable than all the household of his father. And Hamor and Shechem, his son, came to the gate of their city and spoke with the men of their city. Now, man, I can't imagine a harder sell. You know what? I mean, all right, guys. I got some good news and I got some, I don't know, not so good news. I mean, it just all depends on how you look at it, right? And Hamor and Shechem uh, came to the gate of their city and spoke with the men of the city, saying, These men are at peace with us. Therefore, let them dwell in the land and and trade in it, for indeed the land is large enough for them. Let us take their daughters as our wives and let us give them our daughters. Only on this condition will the men consent to dwell uh, with us, to be one people. Uh, You know, it's just a small thing. If every male among us is circumcised, is there circumcised? I mean, he gives them the upside first, right? He says, you know what? It's going to be great. These are good guys. You know, they're really good guys. And we can marry their kids and our kids can, and uh, our kids can, uh, we can marry their kids and their kids can marry our kids. It's going to be great. You're just going to, I don't know, have to be circumcised first. (laughs) And all the years perk up like, what? (laughs) Yeah. You just have to be circumcised first. That's all they're asking. You know, okay, I know it sounds bad, but look at the bright side. You know, personally, as soon as I would have heard the word circumcised, it would have been impossible for me to see any bright side, right? But but he says, no, come on, guys. There's an upside to all this. I'm telling you, if I owned a car lot, these are the guys I want working for me because they can sell anything apparently, no? Right? So... Verse 33, they say, will not their livestock, their property, and every animal of theirs be ours? Only let us consent to them and they'll dwell with us. He's basically saying to them, look, we'll absorb them as a people. They'll basically disappear and whatever they possess now, it's going to be ours. There's nothing they can do about it. And because Jacob won't step up, 
it's unbelievably dangerous now what's going on here because the bloodline of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob through which the Savior is to come into the world uh, is in terrible danger of disappearing from the face of the world right here. Right? God's going to have to step in and protect his plan of salvation. Verse 24, And all who went out of the gate of his, of his city heeded Hamor and Shechem his son. Every male was circumcised, all who went out of the gate of his city. So all the males of the city, uh, they bought into the upside. You know, yeah, that does sound pretty good, right? Getting rich was worth the pain of circumcision, so every male in the city gets circumcised. Now, don't think for an instant, you know, our grandson just recently got circumcised, right? It's a nice, sterile environment, you know? I mean, scalpels, they've been in the autoclave. They're sharp, you know, precision, you know, sharpened, right? There's painkillers, right? Um, not in this situation. The circumcision was done with semi-sharp stones, right? It was done by people who had never done it before. I mean, this is total on-the-job training. And the last thing you want to hear that day is, whoops, right? It's just like, what do you mean, whoops? I remember uh, you know, when, I was, when I was first practicing, when I was first in practice, I had a patient and, uh, you know, I don't remember exactly what it was, whether I looked at an x-ray or whatever it was, but with, without any control on my part, it came out with a, wow. <laughs> and they're like, wow, wow, what does that mean? That's medical language for I have everything under control. <laughs> this is the last thing you want to hear from a doctor. Whoops, wow, right? So just imagine the potential for an infection here. They're doing this in a field. The potential for infection. And a result, you know, as a result of this uh, procedure, all these men, they're not feeling their best at this point. Verse 25, now it came to pass on the third day when they were in pain that two of the sons of Jacob, Simeon and Levi, Dinah's brothers, each took a sword and came boldly upon the city and killed all the males. Now, Simeon and Levi, they're full brothers of Dinah. Leah is the mother of all three of them. Simeon and Levi, you know, they're very cunning. They're very crafty here. They waited until the third day when things were at their worst in regards to pain and the ability of these men to move about. And they come into the city and they kill all the males. It's just so tragic. It's so dark. And it doesn't get any more wrong than this. James 1.20 says, The wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. One man sinned against their family. There was one man that they should have focused uh, their justice on. And to kill every adult male in the city was so far off the charts. It was just so completely wrong. And I mean they killed fathers, they killed sons, they killed grandfathers, they killed brothers, they killed uncles, they killed sons, they killed everyone. And their actions cannot be defended. You know, these guys, these two guys committed mass murder. In 26 it says, And they killed Hamor and Shechem, his son, with the edge of the sword and took Dinah from Shechem's house and went out. I just, uh, you read that and you just say, what? Right? We read here that Jacob allowed Dinah to be in the house of Shechem for three days. I mean, just put yourself in her place. Even though Shechem couldn't do anything sexually, still, Jacob allows his daughter to, to be with the man that raped her for three full days. I mean, how do you think she felt about that? And verse 27 says, The sons of Jacob came upon the slain and plundered the city because their sister had been defiled. Now the other nine brothers, they come along and they plunder the dead of the city. They plunder a city full of grieving women and children. Right? 
Simeon and Levi are cold-blooded mass murderers, and now the other nine boys, man, they're just common thieves now. And it's all because Jacob wouldn't take a stand. He wouldn't lead his family into what was right. He wouldn't put a stop to it when he saw it brewing. Men, we're called to lead our families. Verse 28, they took their sheep, their oxen, and their donkeys, what was in the city and what was in the field, and all their wealth, all their little ones and their wives, they took captive and they plundered even all that was in the houses. I mean, this is just unimaginable what they've done, right? Not only have they plundered the dead, not only have they taken the women and children captive, but now they're ransacking the houses to see what they can just steal. They just want to steal everything we're stealing. And verse 30, then Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, you've troubled me by making me obnoxious among the inhabitants of the land, among the Canaanites and the Perizzites. And since I'm few in number, they will gather together, gather themselves together against me and kill me. I shall be destroyed, my household and I. When Jacob raises up to speak out about what's happening, he doesn't raise up and rebuke Shechem and Hamor for the defilement of Dinah. He doesn't rebuke his sons for the cold-blooded mass murder and the plunder of the city, taking the women and children captive. He doesn't rebuke them for that. You know, the burr under Jacob's saddle is that they've put his life in danger. That's the problem for him. He says when the neighboring people hear what's happened, they're going to come out and wipe me out. His only concern is that they put him and the family's safety in jeopardy. He doesn't even consider for a moment how God's righteousness has been tarnished, how these boys lied and pulled the covenant of God into that lie. Jacob has zero concern for the people who have been murdered or for the women and children who have been taken captive. He's only thinking about himself and what's going to happen to him. But none of this would have happened if he was where God had called him to be. Had he not stopped short of what God called him to do, had he not, uh, been obedient to what God had told him to do, all of this ugly mess, right, would have been avoided. Verse 31, but they said, the boys say, should he treat our sister like a harlot? And we read this, and because we're so used to, to rebellion in our culture, because we're so used to the lack of respect of authority, you know, this statement, it doesn't move us, it doesn't shock us one bit. You know? But for these sons in this patriarchal society to first of all raise up and commit this act without their, their father's approval, let alone without his knowledge and the culture, that would be unthinkable. No one would ever do such a thing. Not only would it be offensive to everyone in that culture, but that was the father's decision to make, what they were going to do, how they were going to respond. You don't go behind your father's uh, back and commit such a barbarous act. You just don't go and make decisions that reflect poorly on the family without your father's knowledge, right? What they have done is overwhelmingly shocking in this uh, culture. But then, when their father confronts them about it, even when backed up by the weakest of excuses, Man, you don't throw it back in your father's face in this culture and say, well, you didn't do anything. At least we did something, Dad. You know, you just didn't do that in this culture. You wouldn't respond to a rebuke from a patriarch of the family in that way. And again, our culture has been so tainted by sin and rebellion, you know, it's almost impossible for us to understand how terrible this is. 
They dismiss this, his rebuke completely. And it just reveals that Jacob is leading a family that is completely outside of his control right now. Jacob has lost control of his family. And he's lost complete control of the most important family alive on the face of the earth at this time. He's lost complete control of the family that is to bring the Savior of all mankind into the world. And Dinah is raped. Simeon and Levi are mass murderers. The rest of the boys are complicit in their actions, becoming common thieves. They have foreign gods in their midst in this family. We're going to read in chapter 35 when we get there. They're drifting from God's purpose for their bloodline, right? Instead of being a blessing to other nations, they're out there murdering and killing other nations. God's reputation is being damaged here. Jacob is not leading in his home, and his children are in full-blown, open rebellion to him and his authority. And it's just one big mess at this moment in time. So what does a father do when he finds himself in that kind of a situation? What does any person do when they find themselves in that kind of situation? When the whole thing looks hopeless, like it's a total loss, what are you to do? What's a father to do in a time like that? And it's exactly what God tells Jacob to do. He tells him to go back to Bethel. Chapter 35, verse 1. Then God said to Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel and dwell there and make an altar there to God who appeared to you when you fled from the face of Esau, your brother. God looks at the whole thing and he sees it just as it is. How I wish that this would be burned into our hearts and minds that it would be there every time the Holy Spirit wants to bring it to remembrance. When a situation is deteriorating, hopefully long before it gets as bad as the, the situation here in Jacob's life and family. But when the situation starts to break down, you know what? I pray that we would hear the Lord's voice instructing each of us to go back to Bethel. Go back to the place where you first met the Lord. And that's the significance of Bethel. It was where Jacob first met the Lord 30 years earlier. When he left the land of Canaan and he headed towards Padan Aram, right, uh, to, to the place where God, uh, Jacob first met God. It was that one night. He's so very tired, you remember, so very tired from his travels, his journeys. You know, he lays down to sleep. He grabs a rock for a pillow. I mean, that's got to tell you how tired he is, right? But during that night, God gave him a vision of a ladder that stretched from earth up to heaven, and angels were ascending and descending on the ladder, and God was at the top of the ladder directing everything in regards to uh, the human condition, and God revealed himself that night to Jacob, and as God, as Jacob wakes up the next morning, he commits himself to the Lord, and what God is doing here with Jacob is he's calling him back to that place where he first met the Lord. Come back to the place where you met me. Back to the place where you were personally, where you personally were when you met me. Back to the place where things, when things were simpler, when things were clear. Back to the place where all you had in your hand, Jacob, was just a staff. It was just you and God's promises. Now you have flocks, Jacob, you have a family, you have a fortune, but you've drifted from that first commitment because of those things. You know, you've drifted from simple obedience um, in your walk with me. And God is telling him, come back to me now, Jacob. Come back to me and resume a close, personal walk with me that you had at the beginning. It's the answer to all of Jacob's problems. And it's very similar 
what Jesus spoke to the church of Ephesus in the book of Revelation. He called them to return to their first love, right? To come back to their first love relationship. You know, I think it's a strange thing. You know, walking with the Lord for many, many years, you know, it's a beautiful thing, actually. You know, I don't know how long you guys have been believers. I've been a believer now for 42 years. That's been 42 wonderful years. You know, and during those long walks with the Lord, we can learn so much about the Lord. And we have opportunity after opportunity to go deeper and deeper with Him. And there's tremendous blessing for a long with, that comes with a long walk with the Lord, you know, just to get close to Him and just have this deep personal walk with the Lord for many years. That's tremendous. The opportunities for service are multiplied the longer you walk with Him. And what a blessing it is to serve the Lord. But sometimes we can look back over the many years of walking with the Lord, look back when we first met Him, and say, I'm so much mature now in the Lord. I'm so much further along now with the Lord than I was back then. And we can look back at our beginnings and think, that's something, that time back then, it's something that is inferior, inferior to the things that I'm engaged in right now. And yet God continually brings his people back to the early days of brokenness and repentance. Because what a special, it's so special to the Lord, right? Those early days of brokenness and, and, and uh, repentance, right? Maybe you don't know as much then as you know now, right? But the commitment then was whole. The commitment was complete. The desire to obey him was complete back then. Whatever he said, 100%, I'm going to do it, right? That's it. It wasn't up for conversation. It's just what I'm going to do. He says it, I'm going to do it, period. And when God brings this great, life that we now have, right, out of that type of obedience, when this great life that we now have becomes a threat to that obedience, right, he wants to bring us back to the simplicity of an earlier life. And you may think you're better off now with all the blessings and knowledge that you have in God, but if the obedience is not there, God would have you return to Bethel, right? To the simplicity of faith, to obedience you once had when you first got saved. And you may think you're better off now with all the blessings and whatever, but you were better off then when you first got saved, right? And that's why Jacob, that's why God is calling Jacob back to the beginning. And as we look through Genesis 35, when we get to it, Lord willing, uh, well, now it's going to be a few weeks. We're going to see Jacob take charge of his family. He's going to answer the call. He's going to take charge of his family like he never had before because of the call to return back to Bethel. And you know, as I was just preparing for the study tonight, and I just, I just wonder, what is it, Lord, you want to speak to people's hearts tonight? What is it you want to speak to people's hearts from this chapter? And, you know, I, I think t for me it, it seems clear is maybe, you know, your family life is in full-blown rebellion, you know. Uh, <laughs> maybe it isn't as bad as Jacob's. Maybe, you know, your kids aren't murdering people. Maybe they are. I don't know, you know. I'm sure it's not like that but maybe there's a drift that has occurred. Drift is imperceptible. I mean, you don't even know it's happening. Maybe you've left that simple faith you once had, the excitement and the joy of the Lord you once had, and the Lord would call you back to Bethel. Maybe God has blessed you with so very much. I mean, we are very blessed people, aren't we? But the love of for the things of the Lord, it's not what it once was. He would call you back to Bethel. 
If you were ever more in love with Jesus, more excited about salvation, more enthusiastic about what he's done in your life, saving you, setting you free, if you've ever looked and prayed for opportunities to tell others about Jesus more than you do now, the Lord would call you back to Bethel. He would call you back to your first love, back to a place where your commitment and your obedience was 100%. But Gary, how do I get back there? I want to go, but how do I get back there? I don't know how to get back there. Well, Jesus told the church of Ephesus in the book of Revelation, he said, first, remember where you've fallen, right? Where you've fallen from, you know? The love, the joy, the excitement, the commitment, right? The desire that you once had. Remember where you've fallen from. Remember what it was like back then. Then two, repent. The church of Ephesus in the book of Revelation, they had to see their, their situation for what it was, what it is, where they've fallen, and then confess it to the Lord, and then turn around and head back to it. Because that's what repentance means. It just means a change of direction. I'm going this way, but I'm going to turn around and I'm going to go that way. That's what they had to do. And then the third thing Jesus told them to do was to redo those things that you used to do. Redo those first things again. They had to remember, you know, what it was they were doing. Well, back then, you know what? I read more. I read the Bible more. I just read every Christian book I could get my hands on. I witnessed every chance I, could, I, I had. You know, I was in church every Bible study. They had a Bible study. When the church was open, I was there. You know what? I didn't wait to get to church. I just sang songs to the Lord, songs I made up in my heart, just telling him how much I loved him, how thankful I was for him. And I told him constantly how much I loved him. I prayed. You know, whatever it was, do it again. God is willing to lead you back if you're willing to repent and or willing to remember, repent, and redo. You know what my encouragement to us as a church, anybody that's watching online, my encouragement is let's finish this crazy year 2020. Let's finish it strong. And let's start the new year right. Boy, if we got to go back to Bethel, let's go. There's no shame in going back to Bethel. That's the place where we met the Lord. That's the place he'll meet us again. That's where res restoration can occur. Let's pray. Father God, I just, Lord, I thank you for your word. Lord, and I don't know, uh, Lord, what part of this study is for which person. But Lord, I trust that this is your word for us today. Lord, for us here, for those watching online, those that are going to watch in a month or so off YouTube, Lord, I just pray your word would penetrate our hearts in such a way, Lord, that we would return to simple faith, to complete obedience, Lord, and just a total love relationship with you that, that maybe we've lost. Lord, maybe we need to step up and take a leadership role in our family and be the, the leader of the house, the leader of our family, Lord. It's hard for us as men. I know it. It's hard for me. Lord, empower us for that, for your glory. Lord, help us. Lord, we love you. We pray that your word would have an eternal work in our life. Whatever purpose you sent it out for, would it be accomplished in our hearts tonight, Lord? We ask these things in your name, Jesus. Amen.